Members of the Green Party of England and Wales are currently voting to elect a new executive, commonly known as GPEX. Voting closes on the 31st of August and Bright Green has been interviewing as many of the candidates that are willing to be interviewed. Today, I'm joined by one of the candidates for the chair position. But before I introduce them, I just have one thing to ask of you, which is that you scroll down right now and hit that subscribe button. It means that you won't miss out on any of the other interviews that we may be putting out with the, with the other candidates if they finally do agree to an interview. Uh, but it also means that you won't miss out on any of the other content Bright Green is putting out in the coming weeks and months. So scroll down right now, hit subscribe, and you won't miss out on anything. So without further ado, I'll introduce our candidate that is with us today. So I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by Ash Ralph. Ash, how are you doing? Uh, I'm doing pretty well. Thank you. Good, good, good. So I will start you off with hopefully a relatively easy question, which is, oh, but before I do, what I didn't say was that Ash is um, not standing solely as a candidate for GPEX, but is standing a, as a job share with Melanie Earp. So uh, only Ash will be joining us today, but when you get to your ballot paper, you will see two names on there. Um, Melanie hasn't not been invited. She just wasn't able to make it today. Um, so back to the question. Uh, the question I am putting to you first is why do you think you would make a good chair of GPEX? Sure. Well, um, the thing is, there are a lot of problems in the party right now. Um, and the problems that are quite serious, they need to be addressed. Um, we've we've had a lot of mismanagement in recent years. Uh, we've got legal cases against the party ongoing. And Mel and I both believe that there is a, a strong need to have somebody at the helm chairing GPEX who understands these problems, who appreciates them, who knows that they exist and isn't just going to try and kick the can down the road and ignore them. Um, with Mel, we get legal knowledge, legal experience, which is going to be absolutely essential for the party to ensure that we aren't exposing ourselves to, to further lawsuits. And with me, from my background on Standing Orders Committee, we get a constitutional knowledge of the party, um, which means we can be more confident that GPEX will be abiding by the rules of the party, the, the, abiding by the rules laid down, and will be listening to and respecting what conference has instructed the party to do. At, at the moment, GPEX has been a bit of a, a, a force unto itself and hasn't done this. With me and Mel at the helm, we think we can get things back on track and get the party behaving in a professional, legal and constitutional manner so that we, uh, we're ready for the next general election and for the next set of local elections. So a couple of the comments you made there lead me on to some of the other questions I wanted to put to you. The first of which and I think you've alluded to part of it um, in your opening comments. Um, but what do you think are the biggest priorities for GPEX over the next two years? Um, number one, we need to settle the, on the ongoing legal challenges against the party. Um, when I say settle, I don't mean literally settle legally. I mean resolve um, through whatever means is most appropriate. Uh, we also desperately, desperately need to increase member engagement with our party democratic processes. We need more people coming to conference, but we also need more people engaging with um with these internal elections as also with selection for our local elections and for the next general election which probably is going to come up pretty soon i think at the moment our membership engagement is really low and understanding of our internal processes is also quite poor and that is down to um groups like gpex failing to publicize themselves properly failing to advertise what they're doing and failing to explain the significance of it we need to change that Member apathy is a huge problem in our party. And if we get people more engaged, more switched on and more aware of what's going on, then members will be more engaged and we'll have a healthier party for it. We'll have more candidates, we'll have more activists and we'll have more competition for internal roles, meaning we'll get the best people possible. Membership engagement um, is something that I wanted to talk about. And I think if you were to speak to... Uh, a cross section of the party of members who are relatively involved and by relatively I mean you know they they might go to the occasional local party meeting they might deliver some leaflets at, at election time I would guess that if you were to speak to those people the overwhelming majority of them would have no idea who sits on GPEX have no idea what GPEX is and does um, and that's reflected if you look at the turnout in internal elections so 
Um, when there's a leadership election going on, GPEX um, elections tend to have a higher turnout, not a particularly high turnout. It looks around 15 to 20%. In years when there isn't a leadership election, it tends to be uh, around 10% and even lower. Um, so only one in 10 members engaging in even the simple action of voting for a member of GPEX, let alone understanding what's going on at the, uh, the level of one of the two primary governing bodies. Um, so there's a massive disconnect between GPEX as a body, its members and the membership at large. If you were elected as chair, how would you improve the relationship between GPEX and, its mem and the party membership? Absolutely. Uh, the first thing to do is to get rid of the labyrinthine process required to actually attend GPEX. If you want to find out what GPEX is, you have to go onto the member's website and you have to click through multiple pages just to find a page about GPEX and a few paragraph explanation of what GPEX is. And then you have to click further again to see minutes of GPEX. There are no recordings of GPEX meetings. Um, and if you want to attend a GPEX meeting, you have to then email the secretary and ask for permission to attend the GPEX meeting and then get emailed back. The whole system seems like it's designed to keep people out. It seems like it's designed to keep observers out of GPEX meetings, to keep scrutiny off GPEX, and to keep people just generally unaware of what GPEX is and what GPEX is doing. There's also been a habit to just rely on party emails as a way of advertising what GPEX is doing when rarely that gets done. It's not a good way of operating. The party sends a huge amount of emails and most members are not opening them. And if members are opening them, like you say, most members are just engaging at a local party level. They might be opening local party emails. They're certainly not opening very many national party emails. We need to really rethink this. We need to really um, change that approach. We need to make JPEX more obvious on the website. We need to make JPEX easy to attend, easy to access. Uh, we need to change the right that only GPEX members uh, speak in GPEX meetings. The reality is there are people from all kinds of different um, backgrounds from different local parties who have things that are relevant to GPEX to say. I think it would be appropriate for GPEX members to be able to bring people in to speak about issues that are relevant. If we're talking about elections in Brighton and Hove, then we should be bringing a Brighton and Hove councillor or somebody from the Brighton and Hove exec in to talk. If we're talking about um, the effects uh, that disabled members are suffering because the party is um, innately discriminatory, then we should probably be bringing uh, a, a representative from uh, the Disabled Greens group to come and talk at GPEX. We shouldn't just rely on the idea that the, these handful of elected voices are somehow able to speak with experience in every possible issue. We need to really change that. And if members were able to actually speak at GPEX, maybe members would be a bit more engaged with GPEX as well. Um, so I think just changing that culture and also changing how easy it is to access GPEX meetings would be a really good first step. I mentioned earlier that GPEX is one of the two uh, primary governance bodies that the party has. There's uh, the Green Party Regional Council and there's the Green Party Executive, uh, GPEX, which is what we're talking about today. And GPEX, um, for viewers watching, is uh, the body within the party that has uh, oversight of the party's finances, some elements of the party's strategy, the party's staff team, um, and other aspects of the day-to-day -day management of the party. So GPEX is an incredibly powerful body because it controls the purse strings and a whole bunch of other things. Now, we are recording this interview at the time of the Tory leadership election. Um, it looks like that the, there's not going to be a general election um, in the next sort of three to six months. That may well change in the coming days and weeks. But we at the moment, I think it's, it's reasonably fair to assume that we have a, a, a relatively long lead in time to the next general election. So if you were elected as chair of GPEX, how would you steer GPEX so that it can get the party general election ready so that the Greens can win more than that one MP in Parliament next time around? Um, staff retention would be the big one. We are a fairly terrible employer. Our pay isn't especially competitive and um, our staff turnover is very, very high. Staff in the Green Party are, generally speaking, not very happy, which means we have to deal with constant staffing problems. Um, if we have happier staff, these are the people that are supporting all of our work in the party. These are the people that are supporting our elections. These are the people who are supporting our campaigns. If they're not happy, we've got a serious problem. Um, and that is affecting us and it has affected us quite poorly. We 
desperately need to change that. We need to improve the employment culture in the party and chair, that's where the buck stops. Um, we need chairs that understand employment law, that won't break employment law, which has happened in the past, and that won't uh, mistreat uh, or neglect or abuse staff members. It's absolutely crucial that we change that staffing culture. If we have happy staff, then we have a solid support base for the party, which is absolutely crucial for everything else we do. I'm going to move on to uh, that question around staff in a moment, because I've got a specific question I wanted to ask on that. Um, but I guess beyond uh, that uh, improvement to supporting uh, staff and getting staff and culture in a place where you'd like to see it, um, what changes would you make or what would you be doing on GPEX to um, you know, be driving forward the Greens electoral strategy so that we are ready for that next general election? Sure. Uh, I mentioned this in uh, Hastings not long ago, but we need to be a little more intelligent about how we're targeting seats. We have finite resources. Um, I don't think anybody's operating under the idea that we can throw huge amounts of funding at every single seat in the country. We're simply not in that position. We need to think intelligently about how we get from one MP to two to five MPs as, as a foothold to, to work towards growth in the future. One problem we've got, I think, is that GPEX is targeting resources at focusing on getting our leaders elected, not because they live in seats that we would necessarily target otherwise, but because they are our leaders. I don't think this is a very healthy way of operating as a party. I appreciate the temptation to want our leaders to be elected MPs, obviously, um, but if we're throwing money at a seat that is very, very, very unlikely we're going to win because one of our leaders lives there, then that is money that is wasted. It's money that could be better applied elsewhere. We should be taking a really academic, really intelligent approach about how we target those resources. We should be focusing on seats that we think are the most winnable, not on the faces that we'd like to see become MPs. So I'll move on to the question around staff now. So uh, you mentioned staffing in your initial response to my questions around the next general election. And uh, some, some viewers may or may not know this, but GPEX essentially acts as the uh, employer of staff within the Green Party. So it's the body that is responsible for HR, for, um, uh, for overseeing the HR policies and practices and for, for being the, the, the primary employer of staff. Um, so as chair of GPEX, how would you uh, work towards better supporting the Green Party staff team? I think the first thing to be done by whoever the next chair is is to arrange um, for all Green Party staff to have the opportunity to anonymously voice any concerns they have and any problems they've faced uh, whilst employed by the Green Party. I think the reality is that we need something comprehensive that says, here are the problems, here's how we uh, can start to address them. And so we can identify staff concerns precisely in their own words, then it's gonna be really hard to address them. So I think that is absolute step one. And then once we've once we've heard those concerns, we can take a, a, a sensible approach, a sort of approach you'd expect a HR department to take on how we address those problems. A lot of them are going to be on understanding employment law, on fair pay and on not overworking our staff, because a lot of them are asked to work hours beyond what they're actually contracted. I guess well, finally on this point around staff, I guess that you've you've kind of talked about that being done through, I guess, like an anonymous reporting process or through a survey or, or, or whatever it is that you've got envisaged there. I guess that there is an existing staff trade union which the, the the party negotiates with. Do you not think that the approach that you've kind of uh, suggested there might undermine the the collective bargaining approach that that is central to trade unionism and to the relationship between the trade union and uh, party management? No, I don't think so. I'm extremely pro union. Um, I I don't think that undermines anything. I think management getting to grip with issues that the members face is the absolute first step towards achieving what unions set out to achieve, which is to, to resolve problems for their members and to advocate for them. But not all of our staff are in, um, and not all of our staff are, are unionized. This is a, simply an opportunity to ensure that every single person has got exactly one voice. There's no need to funnel it all through one person. This is just an exploratory project. This isn't uh, a process through which we always engage with our staff. It's just, we know there are a lot of problems. Please tell us about, about them now so that we can start the process of looking at them. It's not 
it's not overlooking the unions and it's certainly not disregarding them or minimizing their, their impact. So I'm going to move on to a couple of uh, other areas before I wrap up with my flippant question that I always finish on. Uh, but before we do that, so on the other areas, um, so we've talked about the kind of wide remit of GPACs. Um, what do you think is the biggest challenge facing the Green Party right now? Time. We, we don't have uh, enough time. The political direction of the UK is extremely worrying. We are, there's no, no way around it, simply not doing even close to enough um, about climate change. And one thing that I predict, and I've predicted for quite some time now, I think there will be a green government in my lifetime. Um, but I think that that government is going to exist in a time past what a lot of people consider to be too late, quotation marks. Um, we've gained about a thousand new members in the last month or so. And I think the reason for that is the heat wave. I think whenever people are directly affected by climate change, they're thinking more about the climate and they're thinking more about the Green Party. What worries me is the idea that by the time we gain a Green government, it might be because huge, huge amounts of the country are being flooded, having their houses destroyed, um, are facing real serious problems, uh, shortage of food, unable to pay the bills, these kind of problems stacking up and people then voting green. And what worries me is I think a lot of our policy and a lot of our thinking is present preventative in nature. And I think that we're soon going to have to perhaps wrestle with the idea that by the time we get into government, that it's not necessarily prevention that we're working towards, it's it's repair. Um, and I don't think a lot of our policy is geared towards that. I don't think a lot of our thinking is geared towards that. And it's an uncomfortable thing to think about. But I really think it's something that we need to start focusing on because I don't think we're going to be in government in the next five years. And if we're in government in 40 years, then what we need to do is going to be very, very different to what our policy currently suggests. The final kind of serious question to finish off on um, relates to uh, an area which I think um, most people who you know are involved with the Green Party at a kind of uh, national level or have any uh, have observed any of the um, goings on at a national level within the Green Party, um, and it's around diversity within the party and discrimination within the party. So, for some context for viewers. Um, you know, we have a deputy leadership election going on at the moment. Um, and in that election, there are four candidates, all four of whom are men from London. We have, uh, if you look at the party from top to bottom, um, from elected representatives, councillors, target candidates, members who sit on committees, as a party, we are overwhelmingly white. And um, with the current political context where you have the Conservative Party in particular, um, and the media, uh, initially just the right-wing press, now consistently almost the entirety of the mainstream press, um, whipping up a moral panic around trans people, and that scourge of transphobia that's infecting parts of society is also infecting parts of the Green Party as well. Now, GPEX has a really important role in terms of tackling issues of diversity and discrimination within the Green Party. So as chair of GPEX, how would you and Mel tackle these issues? Um, so th th there's a lot of angles here. First of all, I've mentioned it in a previous hustings, but I'll mention it now. There's a motion going to conference, reopen nominations to avoid all men and all white internal elections. It's a baby step, but I think it's a really important step. Um, I think that members should definitely um, take a look at that motion uh, and, and consider uh, prioritising it. I also, going beyond that, um, I think we need to listen to our representative groups and to the Equality and Diversity Committee. I sat as an observing member on the Equality and Diversity Committee for um, quite some time, and the common thread was that they're being ignored. I think things like their Diverse Matters report, I've read it, it's extremely useful information, but if I'm being completely honest, it's stuff we already knew. It's stuff that was being said in um, 
the Equality and Diversity Committee and in our members representative groups for a long, long time before that report was commissioned. And I, I suspect that the reason that report was commissioned was certain people wanted to kick the can down the road and buy some time oh, we know there's a problem, we've commissioned a report into it, it'll be ready in six to 12 months, uh, and we can't do anything about it until then. I think a lot of people have been stalling for time. I don't think we can do that anymore. I think we need a new code of conduct. I think we need a code of conduct that doesn't rely on um, this idea that we're a small hobby group who can get, get by by all just thinking the best of each other. We have a code of conduct that is effectively a gaslighter's charter. Um, it, it values tone over meaning uh, you can be incredibly offensive you can be uh, incredibly discriminatory but as long as you say it in a polite tone you're probably fine in the code of conduct and vice versa um, you can simply be reacting to discrimination but if you do so with a harsh tone you're more likely to get suspended than the person who actually discriminated against you we need to change that um, if uh, Mal and I are elected as chairs one of the things I'll be doing is presenting to spring conference next year um, if nothing else has passed uh, prior to that, um, I'll be presenting a motion to conference to address that, to change our code of conduct, to get rid of it as a gaslighter's charter and to uh, to push for something that I think is, is more appropriate for a professional party that actually has a hope of giving disciplinary committee the tools it needs to address discrimination in the party, which there is a lot of. We really need to change something and I think changing our code of conduct to allow to give disciplinary committee the actual teeth they need would be a big step in that direction. As promised, uh, my flippant question to end on, um, and you're at a slight advantage because I've asked you this question before in previous uh, GPEX <laughs> elections. Uh, I'll be very interested to see whether your answer has changed, um, but who in the Green Party inspires you the most? Um, oh, it's an interesting one. I think I can remember my answer from last time and I don't think it's the same. Um, I I really like Natalie Bennett. Um, Natalie Bennett's in Sheffield, like me. Um, I've met with Natalie Bennett, actually. We ran a Young Greens meeting in Sheffield. Natalie Bennett came along. Now, turnout was fairly low, so we just ended up sitting in the upstairs room of a pub, having a nice time and chatting. And Natalie was telling me all about her personal history. It was absolutely fascinating. I think Natalie Bennett is is a real model for um, a dedicated green. You know, she she after, after she became our leader is when I really, really fell in love with her because she's always been a strong advocate for us. She's done great work in the House of Lords. Um, she's she's going to be at this uh, forever. And she's extremely dedicated. She works extremely hard. Uh, and I, I really, I love her for that. I also, um, for the same reason, really like Amelia Womack. And I'm excited to see what Amelia does with her post-deputy leader uh, time, because I don't think she's going to be shying away. I don't think she's going to disappear. I think she's going to be incredibly busy and she's going to have so much more time freed up as well to do it. Um, I don't think we've seen the last of Amelia Womack and I'm really excited to see what she does next. You are right. That was not the person you named last year. And viewers <laughs> are welcome to go back to Bright Green's YouTube channel and watch the video from last year and find out who Ash named then. Um, so <laughs> thank Tina you so Rothery. much. <laughs> it was indeed Tina Rothery. Um, So thank you so much uh, for joining me, Ash. Uh, where can people find out about uh, more about your and Mel's campaign? Uh, looking up uh, either of us on Twitter or going to uh, our website which is, I'm going to make sure I get it right, ashandmel.green. Uh, if you go to that website, it has links to both of our Twitter accounts uh, and an email address that we can be contacted from. Um, and campaign materials will go up there. Um, endorsements will go up there very soon as well. Um, that's that's the main point there, ashandmel.green. Uh, go there and it links to everything else. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for joining me and thank you to everyone for watching. I have a few final things to say before you all leave. The first of them is I said it at the beginning. I'll say it again now. Please do scroll down right now and hit that subscribe button. If you found this video and this interview interesting, I'm sure you will find many, many more of our interviews interesting too. So please do hit subscribe and you won't miss any of them. The second thing is 
if uh, we've been talking for nearly half an hour, I'm sure there's plenty in this interview that you've agreed with. There may well be things in it that you disagreed with. Let us know what you think in the comments down below and keep the conversation going there. And the final thing is that Bright Green does not have the backing of big business and billionaires. We rely solely on the kind and generous contributions and donations of people just like you. So if you are able to, please do head to bright Green dot org forward slash donate and set up a regular donation so we can keep doing everything that we do so that's everything from me thank you all so much for watching and i'll see you all very very soon